Joining us now, Micro Hive founder and chief executive officer Bilal Hafiz. Bilal, I mean, it's exciting, right? There's a new prime minister, whether you agree or not, it's always exciting to have a fresh face. You kind of wonder who they'll put in place and how she's going to pull this off. This is a terrible moment for the UK economy. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's going to be the perhaps the most um, challenging environment that uh, incoming prime minister has had for, for many, many decades. There's an energy crisis, broad inflation problems, yeah. growth problems, geopolitical issues. So I think the, the level of difficulty is incredibly high for whoever would have won this. So the most difficult thing that she needs to deal with is, of course, the energy crisis. What's the right way to do this? So I know there are a lot of people asking, look, there's a price cap where you need to, to support some of those um, you know, households that are struggling the most. And then you speak to market participants and you say, but you also need to and destruction. Absolutely. And I think in the end, you need to do a bit of both. And what that means is that you need to have some kind of price cap, especially for the households that are most vulnerable to yeah. raising energy costs. But at the same time, you shouldn't add net new demand to the economy. So you need to tax, you need to take away demand from somewhere else. And that's something Liz Truss has, has ruled out. So in some ways, she's made her life even more difficult yeah. by ruling out lots of different possible uh, policy tools that she could use to deal with this. Well, what I also found surprising is actually she didn't want by the huge, you know, um, gap that we thought she would. Does that change the way that she speaks to the UK citizens? Does it change her policies? And will she ever call for an election? That's a great question. I mean, she didn't get the majority of Tory members in terms of the overall sort of vote that she yeah. had. Um, I think in the end, um, the only way she'll be able to capture a larger segment of popular support will be how she, in her own words, delivers on her promises. Um, I think the other challenge she'll have is, just like any other uh, mid-term uh, you know, um, replacement of a leader, they always struggle to, to replace a former leader. So Gordon Brown had that with uh, Tony Blair. Uh, Theresa May had that with David Cameron. So that's, you know, as an additional challenge that she'll, she'll have. So I think she'll struggle really to regain popularity here. How, how does she get points? We know that, you know, she's had it in for the Bank of England and, and the governor. Can she replace him? Does she challenge the independents and yeah. blame it all on them? Yeah, I mean, I think if she did that, I think that's a very dangerous course for her to follow because then that could potentially lead to broader financial market turmoil and then that would then have an impact on, on the economy. So it'll be interesting to see whether she tries to push for a personnel change at the Bank yeah. of England or a mandate change or does nothing. Yeah. Now, over the what weekend, do you think it will be? I think she'll actually do nothing in the end. I, I think during the campaign trail, it was convenient to blame the Bank of England, um, but I think now that she's in office... She'll, she'll stand back from, from trying to change too much at the Bank of England. I mean, d does pound weakness actually help with exports? Well, it helps with exports, but the issue today is uh, energy no imports. <laughs> yeah, I mean, today the issue is inflation. So what you want is a stronger currency, especially a stronger currency to buy uh, dollar-denominated energy, uh, you know, uh, imports. So. It's a question of timing. In general, the weak currency is good for exports, but it depends on the nature of the cycle we're in. Today's inflation is a problem, so you actually want a strong currency. So uh, how do you think the UK will change in, in the next two to three years? I know we're talking, I mean, I, I mean, two, three years feels like a lifetime yeah. right to go, given the winter that we'll have and maybe the announcements from Liz Truss, the Prime Minister, I in a week. But is there anything that you could be buying right now in the markets that put you in a better fitting? Well, I think at the moment, uh, the UK is likely to underperform, at least for the yeah. next few months. On a more medium-term basis, the UK does have some potential to, uh, to you know, bounce back because it's, yeah. it's doing sort of quite poorly right now, so there's some bounce-back opportunities, but it's an issue of timing. The larger issue I think that's more troubling for me personally is that by her ruling out tax hikes and, and, and talking more about um, uh, you know, free markets and so on, they, she, she may actually suffer from the in income inequality issue within the UK. Um, and if we go back to the 70s, that was a period of very high level of social unrest, strikes and so on. And the risk for the UK is that you get much more social unrest if income inequality widens and you get more strikes. And then that could be a very turbulent time for the UK. But do you think she, she changes? I know we had this very short speech and it felt like, you know, the Liz Trust we had in, in the campaign period. But again, she was talking to the Tory members. Could she actually become the Prime Minister to, to I think I think there is a chance she could because if you look at her track record, she's done massive U-turns right. over the years. She was right. pro-Remain, then she flipped to Brexit, no. she was Lib Dems before, then converted to Tories. So that tells you she does have that ability to change when the circumstances change. Um, the, the question is whether she'll have enough time right. to be able to do all of that. So I think right. the, it, it's, it's, it's going to be very difficult for her to do that. Any part of the guild market that looks attractive? 
I think right now nothing looks okay. attractive on the UK and, and side. And pound will continue to weaken? Pound, I think, will continue to weaken, and the risk is that we, we overshoot to historically mm -hmm. low levels. I think we're in an environment of general dollar strength, and so that's going to be very vulnerable for the UK. How, how long do you think that will continue for? I mean, if it's dollar strength, this helps with commodities, the FTSE 100, I mean, are, are we just, <laughs> am I clutching at silver linings Yeah, there? I mean, I think, I think right now we're not in an environment to start to do the value trade. Fine. So I would hold off for three, four months before one enters okay. into those trades and, and be much more defensive in, in yeah. that kind of context. Um, and Europe in general, where the CUK, Eurozone, has been hit by every single shock you can imagine. Yes. So you probably want to stay away from the region until things stabilize uh, and, you know, instead look at other parts of the yeah. world which, which have more stability. Such as? Well, I think market? US probably looks more attractive on a relative basis compared to Europe. Places like Japan look probably more attractive relative to, to Europe as well. So there's relative, you know, you could play countries against each other. Each other so that's yeah. some opportunities there. Um, Do you play on currencies? The currencies are so volatile. Yeah, currencies are very volatile. Um, my bias would be generally to be long dollars. I think the dollar will still continue to do well in this environment because the US doesn't have the same energy problems as other countries. Right. The Fed's going to raise rates probably more than other countries. So that's positive for the dollar. But at some point, strong dollar or king dollar is also going to be a problem for the US. It will be, but the issue for the U.S. in an environment where there's a shortage of commodities, a strong dollar helps the U.S. And to some extent, the U.S. you know has enough domestic demand to not have to rely on exports. So for now, I think the strong dollar is not so, such a such a big issue. And if anything, it, it it kind of curbs the inflationary pressures, which helps the U.S. Okay. So given what we're seeing in gas and oil prices, th I, I imagine you think the a eurozone recession is, is unavoidable. U.K. Unavoidable. Correct. Yeah. I think in. in both countries, global both recession? regions. A global recession, I would say, is, is probably on the cards as well. Um, you know, China could already be in a recession. You know, for the US, for China, a 2% growth rate, a 3% growth rate is in effect a recession. So I think China is already at those levels uh, as well. So, so I think we are in that recessionary territory, which combined with higher inflation means we're stagflationary environment, which is back to the 70s, which is not a, a great backdrop. Which is a nightmare. Absolutely. Right? Because it's easier yeah. to deal, what's it easier to deal with? I mean, stagflation, and we saw the Bank of Japan, like, unable to do anything. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that the hardest thing right now is that for the last 30, 40 years, every shock that's hit the world, you could always have the central bank able to cut interest rates, whether it was due, a recession in the 1990, whether it was a global financial crisis, they could cut rates. Today, the nature of the shock is such that central banks have to raise rates. So suddenly, we've lost the big support for markets and for the economy. And so that makes everything a lot more challenging. And instead, yeah. you need governmental response, you need cooperation between countries, and that's something that's not forthcoming. All right, Bilal, thank you so much for all of the insight. We went around the world there in eight minutes. Mac macro hives, Bilal Hafiz.